So what we are talking about tonight are functions. So let me get this going. Okay. Module 5 is all about functions. And one of the reasons I like functions is it is because we get to do more reusability. Last week we ta started talking about the concept of reusability. And this week we are getting more reusable. Um, and as I said before, reusability isn't copying and pasting code over and over again. And why is it important? Because it reduces the amount of code we have to write and maintain, which means that our code can be higher quality for less money. But now we give it a name. We're going to create a block of code and we're going to name it. And we're going to be able to call it by name. So we have a new keyword. The new keyword is def. And it, oops, my apologies. I don't know why this is all here, but we're going to get rid of it. Okay, we have a new keyword. The keyword is named def. Def tells Python that you are about to define a function. Because a function has to be defined in full before you actually use it. And I will t show you what that is like in just a couple of minutes. We have some new concepts. We have the concept of an argument. And this is not two people bickering. It's um, a value passed into the function. We have a parameter, which is a placeholder in a function that acts as a local variable for that function. And the parameter receives the value that has been passed during the function call. And there's a one-to-one, -one, mostly a one-to-one -one mapping between arguments and parameters. And then we have this concept of a function call. And that's when we're actually activating the code inside function. Because when we define a function, it's just that. It's a definition. It doesn't actually run the code. So... Function basics, your grouping code for reusability. And what a function really is, is just the name group of statements that has a specific purpose. And that specific purpose can be anything from calculating the area of a triangle to, you know, mining data from Google. A function can be anything that we determine as programmers it needs to be. The function is called from the wider code. So you're going to define a function, and then you're going to call it later. And it is really the, the next phase in our, in our concept of data-driven code. We did some data-driven code in branching. We saw last week in looping how when we changed code in a loop, sorry, when we changed values in a loop, the, the, the code itself, would behave differently. And so this is the next phase in that. We're going to take some code and we're going to put it in a function and then we're going to be able to call that function again and again and again. So here are the basics of a function, defining it. So first thing you're going to have is a def keyword. Def should be in the global scope. So if, if you find that you have a def, until we get to modulate, when we get to objects, it's a little different. But for now, that def needs to be in the global scope. So it shouldn't, you shouldn't have a def inside an if. You should not have a def inside a loop. It's got to be out in the global scope. Now, what's going to happen with that def? That def is going to register what comes after with Python. And, but it won't be run. It's not going to immediately execute this code. It's just going to register the code. It's going to be kind of like reading it and putting it off to the side. Then we have a function name. And in this case, the name is print underscore pattern. And function names pretty much follow the same rules as variable names. After, <clears throat> sorry, and we have the local scope of the function or a code block. You'll notice this is indented one to the right, so it is in the local scope. We've had 
global and local scope for if statements for branches. We've had global and local scope for loops. Now we're having global and local scope for functions. The global scope, what's in the global scope for a function is the name and the arguments, sorry, and the parameters. What's in the local scope is all the blocks of code that are going to be run for that function. Then after the function name, we have parentheses. At minimum, it needs to be an open and closing parenthesis. As we go along in tonight's talk, we'll see how we're going to add things in between those parentheses. And then, as with so many things in Python, don't forget the colon after that closing parenthesis. That is what tells Python the name and the argument list are all done, and anything else that comes underneath that in, its lo in the local scope is part of that function. A function declaration is always started with a def keyword. Function requires at minimum open and closing parentheses. So now we have our definition of our function called print pattern. So that's only the first half. The definition is the first half. The second half is calling the function. So sometime, so somewhere else in my code, I'm going to call that function. Python's going to say, do I have a function called print pattern? Because what I see here is the words print underscore pattern, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. And that tells Python, you're calling a function. So Python has to go back into that registry that it's creating of all the functions that it's got and saying, do I have one that matches this print pattern? Just like everything in Python, it, it is case sensitive. So you have to remember that. And you have to understand whether or not there are arguments that you have to pass. And then what will happen when you print that function is it's going to output, it's going to do whatever that function does. In this case, this is a very simplified function, and it's just going to print out five stars. And then I can call it again. And it's going to print out, so it's going to go back up. It's going to say, I got print pattern. It's going to then print out five stars. And I can do that as many times as I want. Now, this example is massively simplistic. So, you could have just put print and then five stars as many times as you want. However, when we get a little farther in, you're going to see that there that, that you can change the data that you're passing to functions. Gotta define a function before it's called. And I'll show you what happens in a few minutes if you don't. A function is always called by using its name first. When you call a function, it tells Python to actually execute the function, what the lines of code inside or underneath that function call. So parameters and arguments. So now I have a new function. I have the def keyword saying I'm defining a function. I have a function name, print total inches. I have my open parenthesis, and then I have these things inside the parentheses. These are parameters, and parameters are local variables for the function. Just like when you have a for loop and you say, you know, for item in range, whatever, an item is a local variable for that for loop. Same thing here, okay? A parameter is a local variable that exists within the scope of the function. So here I have two parameters. I have num feet and I have num inches. I have, and by the way, all parameters are always separated by a comma. And then I have two lines of code here that is a code block, a local scope code that is going to calculate and print the total inches. That's its complete job. And then a parameter only exists inside the function. It is a local variable for in, in use 
in the local scope of the function only. Um, the value of the parameter is provided in the function call, and that's where arguments come in. Because right now, we don't know what the value of num feet is, and we don't know what the value of num inches is. So the next step is how do we call it? Well, we have our function here that we had on the other page. So here I've got Professor Lisa, and there's somebody's going to ask her to put in feet and inches. So now I want to know what the total inches is. So I'm going to call print total inches. And you will see that num feet is 5, and 5 is going to be transferred to the num feet in print total inches. And num inches is 8, and that's going to be transferred. An argument has to contain a value. That value is positional. So I have num feet and num inches in my print total inches function call. It is directly related, just like these arrows are. Num feet goes to num feet, num inches goes to num inches, and it doesn't matter the name. We're going to see this, and I'm going to switch them, and the outcome will be different but because I've just switched num feet and num inches because it's positional. doesn't matter what the names are in the argument and parameter. It matters what position they are in the order of the function call. So I've got 5 and 8. Num feet is going to be 5 times 12. Num inches plus 8. And I'm going to print total inches of 68. So that is what happens. So let's see. A function, when it's called, must have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function definition almost always. We'll see how that appears to differ in a little bit. So argument order. You just saw me have it in one order. So now I'm going to switch the order. I now have num inches and num feet. That's all I did. I switched and said I'm going to put num inches first and num, in, and num feet second. So I'm going to put in 5 and 8 again. So num feet is 5, num inches is 8 because those are the values that I put for those individual input statements. So num feet is going to be the second argument. Sorry, the, second, the argument that is going to pass the value to the second parameter. 8 is going to now be the first value passed. So I have num feet, which is 8, and num inches, which is 5. The only thing I did was switch those, the positions of those two variables. And so when I do my calculation, it's going to change. Num feet is 8, so it's going to be 8 times 12. Num inches is 5, so it's going to be plus 5. And my total is going to be 101, simply by switching those two. So that's what I meant by positional. So we're going to go come back and return from a function. No, we'll go talk about returning from a function. And then we'll go start looking at some code examples in PyCharm. So... I've got a new function, a new definition. The function is called pyramid volume, and I am um, calculating the area of a pyramid based on its base length, its base width, and its height. And then there's a nice little formula in here. We saw with arguments and parameters how we got data in to the function. So if I call it, values passed into what eventually going to be used as a local variable inside the function, and then it does its calculations. Well, what if I want to get data back into the whatever scope I'm using in my code? How I do that is with a keyword called return, and I just realized I forgot to put return on that keyword page. Um, return tells Python to take a value or a series of values and make it available back to the calling function. So how do we do that? 
we in the function definition and this is just print volume and I have my parameters three of them and I have my local scope or my code block I have the return keyword the return tells Python to make the value of pyramid available outside of the local scope of the function. So I can do a complex calculation and then use it somewhere else. Because right now, Pyramid, could somebody please mute? Whoever joined, could you just, could you please mute? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, could you please mute? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, when we look at this function, pyramid, the value of pyramid only exists in the local scope of this function. What we need is we need to make that sometimes available outside the local scope. Because when this function is done, all the data that was in there goes away. It just flitters away. And the way we do that is we, we use the return keyword and we pass a variable, uh, the value in a variable or potentially a series of variables back into whatever scope called this function. So you only ever see a return state inside the body of a function. So um, let's do this and then we will look at PyCharm stuff. So we have our definition for pyramid volume. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to put in a length, I'm going to put in a width, and I'm going to put in a height, pyramid height. So then I want to know how, what the volume of the pyramid is. So I'm going to pat, call pyramid underscore volume, which is the function, with the length, the width, and the height. The length is 4.5. Again, this is positional, so 4.5 is being passed as the first, uh, per, is being assigned to the first parameter. 2.1 is being assigned to the second, and 3.0 is being assigned to the third. So I now have those values that I can do a calculation with. So I'm going to do my calculation. Pyramid is going to be 9.45. And what happens is pyramid gets returned. Now, if I'm going to use this, I have to have a place for that value to be put. So what I have done here on this line of code is I have pyramid equal pyramid volume underscore length. We know pyramid is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is a function, and we know that that function returns a value, and I want to store that function value someplace. So I'm storing it in pyramid. So oftentimes, if you have a return statement in a function or if you're expecting something back from that function, you're going to want to set, it, uh, set a variable equal to the function call. And then, of course, I'm going to print it. So, Python objects will go into in a minute. Yes. Okay. You're having trouble with 512. I wrote the def print shape, enter print, and then the global scope print shape. Did you use the word enter in there? Or is that just a return statement? No, no um, um, that's just, that's just um, um, me trying to, trying to say, I press, say I press enter. enter. OK, and then you tabbed once after you pressed enter? Yes, ma'am. Yes. OK, and when you called? print underscore shape after you did that, what happened? Um, so I was able to get the three, um, you know, three stars on three columns or rows. 
Uh-huh. And after that, it said, um, you know how it gives another example. Uh, yeah. So I one test passed, but not all tests passed. So I was able to get one test to pass, but not all, because uh, it said if what if it implemented only two rows instead of the three? That's the one that I failed at. Is this lab five one two? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's one of the challenge activities. Okay, I should have all the challenges here. So this is what basically what it was like. Print pattern, and then you just call print pattern, right? Let's get rid of that. And then we'll do this. And this is a good segue. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you. Okay. So what happened is then you called like that, correct? Correct. And what did it tell you after you ran it? Did it oh, try sorry. Print shape. Sorry, if I, 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 it was on the next one ap, uh, after that. My apologies. That's fine. Which one was that? Thought uh, I had 5.1 one. to function call challenge activities. Uh, define print underscore shape parentheses to print the below shape. I thought I had done them all. My apologies. All right. Give us a second and we will take a look real quick. Sorry, I should have had this. Okay, so we're going to 512. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so print pizza area. Given the following program, print the pizza area function defined above. So that's print pizza uh, area. Further below. Okay. As the, as the, okay. And the, um, one more down. Five yes. one two. No, uh, just print shape to print the below shape. Example output. Okay. So, um, I think that what they want is they want these three lines in. Um, just print it out like that. So let me just do it quick on this one. This is just going to be five. Whoops. No, it's not. Oh, let me make this bigger so people can actually see it. I think this is what they want for that one. So it ends up like that, or in, the, in that case with three. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I thought it was kind of like the first one above that one with the example where you uh, duplicate the print uh, pattern twice. To get it okay. instead of um, the print itself, but that does make sense. Okay. Okay, and this is this is a really good segue to one thing that I wanted to to talk about. First, you can have multiple lines in a function, but you have to have things defined or sorry indented correctly. So this is print pattern with three lines. By the way, anybody who hasn't come yet, the challenges are all optional, so I don't mind talking about them, and the code for them will, for the most part, be up on the YouTube channel. Um, there are three lines in print pattern that are in the local scope. However, by simply doing that, there is only one line in the local scope. So let's see what happens. First of all, yeah, let's see what happens when I run this, when I debug this, because anybody who's been here a couple times knows how much I like the debugger. 
So first of all, what's going to happen is the first place this stops, my, my debugger stops, is on this blue line. And this blue, what that means is, is that none of this got executed yet. Did it? I'm sorry, it did. Let me stop. Let me go back. Okay, I'm going to stop here. So, actually, well, I'm going to stop. I put a break point here and I put a break point here. You know what? I'm not being smart. Let's do this. Okay, I have two break points. One inside the function and one at the function call. So I'm going to start the debugger. The first place the debugger stops is on print pattern, is the call to print pattern. You notice it did not stop on lines two through five. That is because all Python will do after a function definition is read the lines of code that are, that are part of that function. And then it will register them and put them off in a bank somewhere. So that's what it did. Nothing will happen inside that function until I call it. So on line seven, I am calling print pattern. Now, if I attempt to step over, what's going to happen is the breakpoint on line three catches the execution. So I have just stepped in to the function. And then I can just execute those three lines of code. Print pattern is now done, and I'm done. So let's take a look at what I was trying to show before. Oh, I don't have to do that. If I backspace here, okay, and I have now breakpoint on line three, line five, and line eight. So if I debug this, the first place Python is going to stop is on line 5. And that is because line 5, because I, I, I removed the tab, is now in the global scope, not in the local scope of the function. So it is going to print out on the console, as is line 6. And then I'm going to go to print pattern. And then I call print pattern. And I'm going to print out another three lines. This is incorrect. That's not what I want to do because maybe I can add some other lines of code in here and that's not what I want. So what I have to make sure of is that these lines are indented if I want them in, to be executed as a function. And these are just print lines. And they're not, you know, are like, well, why couldn't I do it that way? Well, you could, but the we're, we're talking about the principle of how you define something inside of a function. You have to make sure that everything is aligned properly or Python won't do it the way you're expecting. doesn't make that much, um, it's not that huge of a thing with this particular example, but when you get to your project and you're doing move between rooms and you're having to print the instructions, um, that will make a difference. If you have something not in the right place in your function or not indented properly, your your stuff isn't going to work right. It's going to look right, but it's not going to work right. So we have... So here's the pyramid one. And I wanted to go through this to show... Um, yeah, I wanted to go through this to show return and how return can act like um, a variable, like if it's coming back from float or whatever. So let me change this uh, to 5, 3, 3. And so we're going to debug it, stop and rerun. So I'm going to start with variables. We know that there are no variables defined yet. So I'm going to add length, which is 10, width, which is 
which is 11, and height, which is going to be 12. Sorry, width, height. So I have length, width, and height. So I have my three values. So now I'm going to call pyramid volume. And it's going to pass length, width, and height. So there's a couple things I can do. I could set a breakpoint in pyramid volume, but there's this little thing right here in PyCharm that step into. And what PyCharm will do is it will automatically step into the function that you're calling. It is used specifically for functions, and it's very handy. So I'm going to step into it, and then I'm here at, line six. Now, if I look here, over here real quick, I have base length is 10, base width is 11, and base height is 12. And you'll notice in this example, the parameter names are completely different from the, na the argument names. They could have, this could have been A, B, C, D. It does, the names don't matter. The position matters. So now I'm going to do a calculation. I want to go back over to variables. Right now we see base length, base width, base height. We do not see length, width, and height. That's because, okay, in the scope that we are in, we are in the scope of the function. We're in the local scope of the function. Length, width, and height don't exist. None of this exists. None of this line uh, from line 9 to line 14 does not exist within the scope of the function. So we won't see it down here. We're just going to see what exists. And base length, base width, and base height exists. So I'm going to step over. I've done my calculation. I now have pyramid, which is 440. So now what happens if I step over, I'm going to end up back in the global scope. Watch the variables because they're all going to change. I now have height, length, and width because base length, base width, and base height don't exist in the global, global scope. So I'm going to, but you'll see I don't have XX yet because I haven't actually finished executing line 13. When I finally step over line 13, XXX is 440. And then I print it and I'm done. So it's very important to understand what exists when. Because this is the first foray and we're really, we're really um, distinguishing here between what exists in one scope and what exists in the other. This global so scope doesn't exist in the function. You can't get to length when you're inside the local scope of pyramid volume, period. It doesn't exist in that scope. It's like you're drawing a black box around it. The only thing that exists is what come in through base length, base width, and pyramid height. Okay, everything's an object in Python. So, object, an object means that we are encapsulating, encapsulating data and the process into the same container because an object is just a container. An object has a type, an identity, and a value. That is what an object has. And a function is an object. It is not an object in the sense of object-oriented programming, which we get to in week eight. But Python considers it an object. And actually, Python considers just about everything an object. So functions are objects. So they have an identity, value, and a type. The, the identity is the name. The value are the values of the parameters. And the type is the return. So that is 
that is why a function when you're looking at a function that's the that's how you're looking at the type of a function is what it returns and if it doesn't return anything then the type of a function is none the identity of the name and the the values are the parameters that are being sorry yeah the parameters um that will have arguments passed to them scope so I said this just a bit ago, but scope dictates where the variable is av is available for use. And when we get it, we did a little bit of this in branches and a little bit of this in looping, but we're doing a lot now. You have to understand that or you're not going to get your functions correct. You're not going to understand how to be able to get a function to work the way you want. A local variable is defined inside a class or a function or a branch. Global variable is everything else. It's the top level of that program and it's, um, it's all left justified. So a bit more about scope. Um, The global, the, I think I said this before, the name of the function is always in the global scope. The parameters are in the local scope. This is all local scope. This is a local scope, but it gives us access to the global scope. And the function call can be called from any scope. So a function call doesn't have to be called from the global scope. It can be called from the local scope of another function. It can be called from the local scope of a loop, which you're going to do in your game. It can be called from the local scope of a branch. A function can be called from anywhere, as long as it has been defined in the global scope. And arguments um, take data from the global scope and make it available to the local scope. Okay, function arguments and mutability. So basically, um, arguments are mutable, which means a value, in, you can change the value inside a function and have that be reflected back in the calling um, argument. And this is true for strings, it's true for objects. And we can demonstrate that with a function called a swap. Everybody, this is the standard format for swap. Um, and basically what you have is we're going to have a list and we're going to swap some elements in the list. And what we will see is, even though we didn't return the list, the list will have changed in the global scope. And that's what we mean by mutability. So here I put in here good things just and all. And now I'm going to and I split it and I made a list. So I pass that list up to my function called swap. So I have a list and a list is a mutable object. We know that from working with well no we don't because we haven't worked with lists that much. But we did talk about lists and mutability in the string section. So lists are mutable. So what's going to happen? So I'm going to do a swap, which basically I create a temporary variable, and then I take the first value that I'm going to swap, which is the first uh, element in the list, and I put it into the temporary variable. And I want to take the last element in the list and make it the first element in the list. So that's what I do on the second line of this function. And then what I want to do is I want to take that temporary holding place where I put the very first element in the list and I want to put it to the end of the list and here it will change it all good things just end here and when I print it out it will be all good things just end here and you'll notice that there was no return I didn't need to do a return statement because a list is an object that can be modified. And if I am modifying an object inside a function, that, that mutable object will be changed everywhere. 
So some people get confused when they change a mutable object and it changes everywhere and they don't understand why. So this is one of those things where I'm not happy with how Zybooks deals with objects throughout this course. It kind of waits till the end. This example really requires the knowledge of mutability and lists. Um, and we just went through all the return stuff that says, how do I get this out of my function while well, I have to return it? This is the exception to that. And some people occasionally run into this issue in their game. It depends on how they structure their data. Um, so any change to a mutable argument is reflected everywhere that is accessing that mutable object, in this case a list. Default parameters, where I said earlier that you have to call a function with all the parameters, mostly. This is the mostly part. And it's something that not all languages have, but Python does. And it's very, very handy. It is called default parameter values. So I can define a function. And uh, um, in this case, it's called number of pennies. And I want two arguments, dollars and pennies. But I, I don't always want to make someone send pennies in if pennies is zero. So I can define a function in a way that the person um, calling it may only have to pass in one argument or sometimes none. And that's by using this syntax where I have the parameter name equal to a value. Now it can't be equal to another uh, variable name. It has to be equal to a value here. But what that does is that lets Python say, oh, okay, you've already got a value there, so if somebody doesn't pass it, it's okay, I know what to do. So in this case, I could have this nice long statement of print number of pennies int input, and I could input four, and this would work completely fine because Four becomes dollars, and pennies is automatically zero. That's what that equals zero after it stands for. And then I get four times 100, so I have 400 pennies. And that's what's going to be returned and print. So I can do it again. I can do it with five. But I can also ask, for a second value, in this case, I am. So I'm going to say I have $5 and I have six pennies, because I, want, I, want, I don't want to use the default of zero. And then I'm just going to do my calculation and I'm going to print out 506. So that's what the default parameter values do. And they're just very handy. And also, you've already used them. When you have when you call the print function, and sometimes on the print function you have quote or comma end equal and then a space rather than accepting the default new line, you're actually already calling a function with default parameters because you don't always have to put that space, that end equal space or quote space quotes after what you want to print. So that's a default parameter value. And you can have as many as you want, but they have to be at the end of the function definition list of parameters. You can't have pennies equal zero comma dollars. Python won't allow you to do that. It will give you a syntax error. You, so you have to have, it has to be whatever uh, um, Parameters have default values have to fall at the end of the argument list for the, sorry, of the parameter list for the function. Um, yeah, they have to be listed at the end. So, multiple return values. And this is really nice because 
Python is one of the few languages that has the ability to return multiple values. Even in something like Java, you can't return multiple values. You have to put it, you have to define a structure and put it in a structure if you want more than one value returned. Python, you don't have to do that. Python, you can just return all the values that you want. Now, for readability, maybe you don't want to return 100, but you could. So in this case, we're just going to move the second element from list one to list two, and then return both lists. So I've got a function called move it, and I'm going to pass move it a list one, two, three, and a list four, five, six. Now I just told you that lists are mutable, so I don't have to return the list but I am going to return the list because that's what this challenge wants you to do. So I'm going to say, I'm going to, it's kind of like a swap. So I've got temp equal list one of one, which is the first element in the list. I'm then going to take the first element in list one, set it equal to the first element in list two, and set the first element in list two to temp. And then I'm going to return both lists, and I will have... L1 and L2. So the value that's coming from, that contains list 1, will be put in L1. It's positional, just like um, parameters and arguments are positional. And list 2 will be put in L2. So that's how it works. Then you'll print L1 and L2. So if you are doing one of the labs and they say you got to return dollars, quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies. Then you're going to have a return statement with all of those. And so it's just going to print and print. Okay. Um, return values are passed by position in the return statement. And they're all passed by argument. By assignment. So lab 5.18 pseudocode. This is your swap values. Now we did a challenge for swapping values and this is what you want to do. The importance of this program is that you are returning two values. Okay, You're going to set parameter 1 to temp, parameter so, yeah, and then you're going to set the value of parameter 2 to parameter 1, the value of temp to parameter 2, and then you return parameter 1 and parameter 2. When you call them down here, you're going to input 2, you're going to call, and when you call it, you're going to print it, have output 1, comma output 2. Excuse me, you're going to set that equal to swap values where you're going to pass in user input 1 and user input 2. Now you'll notice output 1 and output 2 are different names than user input 1 and user input 2. It can get confusing if you have if you try and reuse the variables from the input. So it is my suggestion that you use um, new variable names and then you're just going to print them out. So um, Pseudocode for 519. We have done 519 before in a different form. Okay, 519 came from Chapter 3, and it is the lab for finding dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So if you have that one working, start by copying it and putting it in Lab 5.19. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. What you do need to do is the part that performs the calculation, not the printing, but the calculation needs to go into a function called exact change. And the function exact change is going to take whatever the user input, 502, 42, whatever. And then you're going to do the calculations for dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, and here's the key, you have to return all of those. You have to return dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies to the global scope that called 
exact change. And then if we look at that global scope that calls exact change, we're going to have user input equals input of value. You're going to set dollars, not quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies equal to exact change, the call to exact change. And then the rest of that, I can't remember the, the exact lab number, the rest of that lab is identical to what you were doing before where you're just printing out everything, okay? You just have to make sure that these, that the variable names of the stuff that was returned is the same as what you are testing here. So don't start from scratch on 519. Go back to module three, grab that because you know it was working, and then divide it up. Create one with the function, which means you're going to make sure that you've got the function definition and everything indented properly. And then you're going to call, just use the rest of it to do the printout. So don't, don't reinvent the wheel on this one, guys. Okay. So do you guys want to see some more function examples? Does anybody have any questions? Um, okay, so Tim, so unlike the relative functions in the earlier chapters, these are positional. Yes. Are you still there, Tim? No, Tim isn't there. Okay. How do we know when something is positional or at all? It's all positional. For anybody who looked, read this, it's all positional. Um, and I, I'm not sure what he meant by relative functions. I would like to see more function examples. Okay. So let's look at 512. Good. Then let's do this. So this is a swap. Or, let's see, this is the number of pennies one. Um, and what's this one? That's just swap. Okay, so here we have the number of pennies one we just saw. Again, this is... Um, let me do something. Let me do something real quick. Uh, I can't drive. We can start the concept of talking about this now and then go back and talk about it next because this is directly related to uh, your, to module six. It's going to come from module six. And where is it? Module six. Uh, open and how you're going to do something called move between rooms, which is, which one is that? Um, sample list. Okay, so, no, this isn't it. I shouldn't have opened this, this is not what I wanted. Yeah, this is not what I wanted. So let me go open the other one. Sorry about that. We'll go back to five and look at the rest of my examples. Uh, module five, open this window. Okay. So let's look at swap because you have to pretty much do something like this, except you're going to have to return. And in fact, let's do something a little different here. Let us define swap instead of with a list here. And we'll do it with something that's not mutable. We'll do it with just values. Okay. So I'm going to say this is val1 and val2. Actually, let me do this. I'm going to see if it's going to let me. val1 and val2. 
temp equals val1, val1 is val2, and val2, 2 is temp, and I'm going to return val1 and val2, and then um, not going to call this guy. I'm not going to call that guy. And I'm going to do that too. And so I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say V1, V2 equals swap uh, 10 and 12. And then I'm going to print one and v two. Okay. So here's what I've done. I've done something that may seem a little odd, but it also gives us an opportunity to talk about another concept that they don't talk about much. This is called polymorphism. Excuse me. And it is the ability to have the same function name but take multiple arguments. So let me make sure that um, it's not going to make a fool out of me. 5, 1, 2, 1. So let's do that. And we're going to debug this because that's what I do. So I haven't gotten any errors yet. And I have v1 comma v2 equals swap, and I'm just passing 10 and 12. So if I step into that, do we know which swap it's going to take me to? It takes me to the right swap. Now, this is an interesting thing because Python allowed me to define two functions with different argument sets but the same name called polymorphism, and it's very handy to use. You don't have to know a lot about it, but I, it bothers me that Python doesn't talk about it. So I am now in the second swap function, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just swap these values. Temp is going to be set equal to val1. Val1 is going to be equal to val2. Val2 is going to be equal to temp. So I now have val1 is 12 and val2 is 10, and I'm going to return these. So what will happen is the value 12 is going to be v1, and the value v and the value 10 is going to be in v2. So when I step over this, you will see, if I go to variables, that there's nothing defined yet because it hasn't finished executing line 17. When I step over it, I have 12 and 10, and then I print 12 and 10. And I could do this with any number of them. So now let's see if I, if I say I'm going to make this 0 and, whoops, 0, because maybe I don't always want to pass the second one. So I'm going to have, I'm going to say swap 10 here. We'll just set the breakpoint there. We'll debug. So my first swap is for 10 and 12. I'm just going to continue. So my console has 12 and 10. So now I'm just going to swap with 10. So I'm going to step into it. It still goes to the right one, and you will see val1 is 10 and val2 is 0. Because I told it, if somebody doesn't pass in a val2, then it's going to be 0. And also, if I look at frames and variables, and I go to variables, I see val1 and val2. But there's no v1 or v2 anywhere. So I'm going to step over, step over. My things are going to be swapped. Val1 is now 0. Val2 is now 10. I'm going to return Val1 and Val2. 
I now, val1 and val2 have gone down here in variables. They don't exist anymore. But now I have v1 and v2, and it's 0 and 10. And if I look at the console, I have 0 and 10. Did that help some? And are, are there any other kind of functions that you would like to see? Any other challenges that that um, that were difficult? Um, I hope so. I hope so, Mark. I know that when we start to get into uh, functions, when the first time the class really accelerates is in week three when we start to do branching. And the second time it starts to accelerate is in week five when we do functions because we're dropping some a lot of new concepts onto students. So if everyone's, if everyone's okay, I'm good with... Uh, finishing the lecture, unless you guys have some questions. If you do, open your mics and we can talk. Going once. Going twice. Okay, I will do my best to have this up tomorrow in the noontime. And I hope everyone has a really good weekend. If you're in my class, please reach out to me if you have any questions. And I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.